On May 2, 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company was incorporated with a royal charter granted from King Charles II of England, giving the company control over an area called Rupert's Land, named in honor of Prince Rupert, the king's cousin and the company's first governor. This counts for approximately one-third of present-day Canada. A fur trading company for most of its existence, it was at one time the largest landowner in the world, which resulted in a trading monopoly over the watershed of all rivers and streams flowing into Hudson Bay. HBC is also the oldest commercial corporation in North America, having been in continuous operation now for 344 years, and today owns and operates retail stores throughout the U.S. and Canada. During the fall and winter, trappers did the vast majority of animal capture and pelt preparation. They traveled by canoe and on foot to the forts to sell their pelts. In exchange, they typically received popular trade goods such as knives, kettles, beads, needles, and the Hudson's Bay Point Blanket. By the late 18th century, they began expanding inland and setting up sale shops. The first department store was in Calgary in 1913. The company exited the first trade as well as retail in northern and remote communities in 1987, and today, the department store business is the only remaining part of the company's operations in the form of department stores under the Hudson's Bay brand. As early as 1831, a trader wrote that the Ojibwe Indians were bringing poor hunts because they had been starving all winter, suggesting that a shortage of rabbits was to blame. The rabbits that he refers to are actually snowshoe hares, which were a primary food source for the natives. When hares were scarce and the tribes had to concentrate on finding food, they didn't have as much time to trap and bring pelts to the company for trading. Historical records contain similar correspondence that appear approximately every 10 years in the 1900s. Fortunately, the Hudson Bay Company kept incredibly detailed trapping records, and over the course of many decades, they observed significant fluctuations in the pelts being brought to them. This created a well-documented record of population cycles for many animals, including the snowshoe hare. However, snowshoe hares weren't the only animals to have populations rise and fall on this same 10-year cycle. A very similar pattern was also observed in populations of Canadian lynx. Now, this may not be surprising, as hares comprise a large portion of the lynx diet, but even if the lynx population size was influenced by the hare populations, what was driving the cyclic fluctuations in the hare populations? There were several hypotheses put forth in an attempt to explain these cycles. Some were quite far-fetched, even suggesting that sunspots affected the hair food supply. There were also overpopulation theories suggesting that physiological stress at high densities increased mortality. For example, after a population high, you get a decrease due to disease or parasitism. However, most researchers lean towards one of two primary hypotheses to explain the rate of change in hair population cycles. The first focused on food supply. Hares are capable of, of consuming large quantities of vegetation, ranging from green vegetation in the summer to branches, twigs, and needles in the winter. The second hypothesis centered on predation. Up to 95% of hare mortality is due to predation, and hares are food for several large predators, including birds of prey and the lynx we mentioned earlier. Both of these hypotheses provided incomplete explanations. Although food can be limiting at peak hare density, there were declining populations that did not appear to be food limited. And while the killing of hares by predators could explain reduced survival rates, it does not explain the drop in hare birth rates that we see during the decline phase of the cycle, or why hare numbers are slow to rebound even after predator numbers plummet. Before we address how ecologists approach this problem experimentally, let us first examine how these population cycles can be modeled mathematically, an approach that will be very similar to the modeling of interspecific competition that we have done previously. In addition to their work on competition, Latka Volterra also independently modeled population change as a function of predator and prey interactions. These models begin with the assumption that in the absence of predators, the prey population will increase at an exponential rate. So let's begin by revisiting that equation. An exponential growth model is appropriate because the reproduction of this prey species is continuous and there is an overlap of generations. So the rate of increase can be calculated by multiplying the number of individuals in the population by the per capita rate of increase. So now let's consider how the population of prey both increases and decreases due to the presence of a predator. We will continue using the snowshoe hare and lynx as our models, and let's begin by modeling the change in population size for the hare. Consider first what would happen if there were no predators. 
the prey population would increase based solely on the population growth rate, which, as we just mentioned, can be explained by the exponential growth model. Now what happens when you add predators? Prey will decrease based on the consumption rate of the predator, or the rate at which the predators remove prey from the population. Recall from the last section that the predator first has to locate the prey, and then capture and consume it. So we need to incorporate a variable that quantifies how efficiently they can do this. The capture efficiency times the number of prey times the number of predators. Why are we including these last two parts? We need to incorporate the number of prey because predators will be more likely to encounter prey if they are there at a higher density. This frequency is also expected to increase as the number of predators increase, hence the incorporation of P. So what about the predators? If there were no prey, the predators would starve, and the number of predators would decrease exponentially with a mortality rate of M. However, in the presence of prey, it's assumed that the prey will be consumed and new predators will be produced. Note that this term represents the number of prey that the predator population is eating. We can take this term and multiply it by a variable that represents the rate at which prey that are consumed are converted to new predators. This entire term, BANP, tells us that increases in the predator population are proportional to the product of predator and prey abundance. Our final model can be represented as follows. Now, this model certainly makes several assumptions. First, note that births and deaths are the only ways in which the populations can increase or decrease. As with the competition models, this does not include any immigration or emigration to or from the populations. Second, the only source of prey death is predator consumption. This does not incorporate death via other means such as disease. Third, there are no other predators or prey incorporated into the model. This would represent a closed system in which lynx are the only animals preying upon hares, and hares are the only animal that lynx are preying upon. I want to emphasize the fact that the population size of one is always influencing the other. As the number of predators increases, the number of prey dying is getting larger and the total number of prey is decreasing. And if the number of prey decreases, the number of predators being born will also decrease, leading to an overall decrease in the population size. This decrease in predators in turn reduces the number of prey deaths, increasing their population size. Let's now continue this trend keeping track of this pattern. We just ended with the prey population, the hares, increasing. Now increasing hares means more for the lynx to eat, so the birth rate increases, increasing the overall lynx population. Increasing the lynx increases the number of hares being consumed, decreasing the overall hare population. Decreasing hares means less for the lynx to eat, so the birth rate decreases, decreasing the overall lynx population. Finally, decreasing lynx also decreases the number of hares being consumed, increasing the overall hare population, and this cycle continues. Let's now take this a step further by creating zero growth isoclines, just as we did with the competition models. If there are too many predators, the prey population decreases. If there aren't enough, the prey population increases. So there's basically a magic number of predators that are just enough to keep that prey population in check. In other words, the prey population will have zero growth. So what will the predator population be when the prey population growth equals zero? When the mortality due to predation equals the inherent growth rate, the prey population growth will be zero. So let's solve for p, the number of predators. Begin by subtracting a and p from both sides. Now divide both sides by a n to isolate p. n cancels, and we're left with p equals r over a. Note that this does not depend on the prey population size at all. This isocline is a constant value of p, constant value of the number of predators, 
regardless of the current population size of prey. If the number of predators is below this number, the prey population will increase. This is because the birth rate is higher than the rate at which predators are consuming the prey. On the other hand, if the number of predators is greater than the number of this isocline, the prey population will decrease. This is because the predators are consuming the prey faster than they can reproduce. Note how this pattern of predictions is slightly different than the competition models, because whether or not the prey population increases or decreases is completely independent of what the prey population currently is. For a single value of n, whether the prey population increases or decreases depends on whether the number of predators falls above or below this line. So what about the predator isocline? What will the prey population be when the predator population growth equals zero? Take a few moments to pause this video and try to solve for n on your own. Continue it once you have done so. Hopefully you were able to determine that n equals m over ba. If not, take a minute to go back and identify your error. If the prey population is below the predator's isocline, the predator population will decrease. This is because the rate at which consumed prey are being converted to new predators is less than the value needed to replace those that are dying. If the prey population is above the predator's isocline, the predator population will increase. This is because the predator population's birth rate, as influenced by the prey they consume, is higher than the mortality rate. I highly recommend making sure that you understand why these populations are changing, rather than simply memorizing the arrows, because you'll notice that unlike the competition models, below an isocline does not necessarily result in an increasing population. If the number of predators is below the prey's isocline, the number of prey increases because of reduced predation. If the number of prey is below the predator's isocline, however, the number of predators decreases because there aren't enough prey to sustain the current population. So what happens when we put these together? If there are more predators than the prey isocline and fewer prey than the predator isocline, both populations will decrease because there aren't enough available prey to supply the predators, but there are a lot of predators consuming the few prey that are available. If there are few predators and few prey, the prey population will rebound and will begin to increase, even as the predator population continues to decrease. Eventually, that prey increase will cross the predator's isocline, and the predator population will also begin to increase. Now there is enough food to sustain them. And finally, as the predator population increases and crosses the prey isocline, the predation pressure will become high enough that the prey population will begin to decline, and eventually the cycle begins again. The net effect is a cycle of population sizes, with the prey always leading the predator. Here is another graph of this cycle that plots both populations on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. The prey population increases first, followed by the predator population. The prey population is then the first to decline, followed again by the predator. I'd like to take a minute to revisit the model's assumptions that I introduced earlier and also address a few more. First, recall that the predator's increase was based on the exponential population growth model alone and that the predators were the only factor involved in their death. This does not account for a carrying capacity, effectively ignoring any intraspecific competition among the prey. Second, it assumes that the predators will starve in the absence of this prey, and does not allow for any prey switching. Third, it assumes that predators will be able to consume indefinite quantities of prey. In other words, as long as prey are available, they will eat them and never get full. And finally, this ignores almost any type of environmental complexity or external factors that would affect the interaction of these two species, such as the prey's food source or seasonal effects. 
Let's now take a minute to revisit our hypotheses for the snowshoe hair and link cycles, and how some field ecologists were able to examine this experimentally. We initially presented two hypotheses, a food supply hypothesis that proposed decline in hair population was due to a shortage of food, and a predation hypothesis that attributed hair decline to predation by lynx and other carnivores. In an eight-year study, one of the most ambitious field experiments to date, Charles Krebs and colleagues from the University of British Columbia monitored how the population of snowshoe hares changed in response to predation and food supplementation. They set up seven one-square-kilometer blocks that were used for three treatments. In one treatment, a four-kilometer electric fence was erected surrounding the block to exclude predators. In another treatment, food for hares was added to the blocks. And a third treatment combined the food supplementation with the predator-proof fence. They also included a control that did not have a fence and it did not have any food added. The fences around the exclusion treatments needed to be checked daily for all eight years of the experiment in order to identify and promptly repair any damage, even in winter temperatures as low as negative 49 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, they were not able to replicate the two fence treatments due to the enormous amount of time required for their maintenance. So what were the results? Compared to the control blocks, hair density was considerably higher in all three treatments. The treatment that added food and excluded predators had the most pronounced effects. Note that the effect of eliminating predators and supplementing food is not simply additive. Eliminating predators doubled the density. Adding food tripled the density. And the combined treatment resulted in a hair density 11 times that of the control blocks. This strongly suggests that interactions over three trophic levels, the vegetation, the hares, and their predators, work together to shape the trends in population growth and decline. Interestingly, all three treatments and the control did show a decline in hare population at the usual point in their cycle. Remember now that this study monitored populations over eight years. So why did they observe this decline? One possible explanation may be related to the types of predators that were excluded. While the fences kept the lynx and the coyotes out of the blocks, they could not exclude owls and other birds of prey. Collectively, those avian predators accounted for about 40% of hair depths and may have been enough to keep the cycle moving. <laughs>